the last song they sang, it just is the entry really to what uh, I think I'm supposed to say. It talked about finding the diamond, finding a diamond in the desert. Did y'all catch that line? I found a diamond in the desert. Nothing else will do. I, I, that line just jumped out at me. And I'm going to start Matthew 13 and 44. We've been talking about the kingdom of heaven, right? We've been talking about the king for most of the year, King Jesus, making him Lord. But now we're kind of going over into the culture of the kingdom itself. And Jesus, many, many, many of his parables was telling us, trying to teach us what the kingdom was all about. He said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field, which hid in the field, the which when a man has found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goes and sells all he has, and he buys that field. Again, the king of heaven is like a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. And when he has found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all he had and he bought it. It's, this is saying, this, what it's telling us is this kingdom is valuable. Amen. What we have is valuable. He compares it to a treasure. You might find it in a field. You found it. Ooh, nobody can find it. It's like when I find a good deal at a garage sale. <clears throat> no. <laughs> you know, one person's, one person's trash is another person's treasure. I ain't got no cash. I had to hide this sucker until I can get back, get the bank and come back. Okay. You, you say, I found something that's valuable. I found something that I want. It's something that I, I and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold on to that. And if I have to go sell something to get it, then that's what I'm going to do. It's saying, he's talking about here about selling out, isn't it? It's saying, a man, if you found something so valuable, if you found this great pearl of great price, you would sell everything you have to buy this. It means it's, it's utmost important. And I, today I just want to remind us of really what we have. I, what we have in this church is, it's like, uh, how many people have said, oh, I'm so glad I found this little church. How many of y'all can say amen to that? You found, you say, man, I, I didn't know this stuff like this really existed. I had somebody uh, that, that's, that's new. That I think, I guess it was, well, I ain't going to call no names. Actually, I, I try not to point people out, especially when they're visitors and guests. But anyway, they said, I, 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 had, to, I had to get talked into coming here because I really just didn't know what it was going to be like. How many of y'all had to have that? I mean, really? It's that? What? You sure about them people? You know, okay, but when you get here, hopefully you find out it's valuable and you see why people want to come. You see why people, even the church, hey, they want to get out in the rain and come. And y'all know this is not really about a church. That's not what this, this is talking about the kingdom. The church is a part of that, but this is bigger than that. This is what, this, this is what Jesus said. He came to teach about the kingdom. He brought us the kingdom. So we've been, we can't really talk too much about that, but so we've been talking about, uh, just kind of jumped into this whole kingdom thing. One reason why we found it's precious, it's, it's a unified kingdom, is it not? Amen. It's a kingdom of unity. And so if we are the members of this kingdom, if this is a family, he's the father, and, or he's the king, and, and we're his subjects, if this is the same thing, he's father, we're children, the first thing we found is he wants us to get along. He wants us to be connected. This was not about a person. It was about a bunch of people, body, people uh, being members in particular, joining together for a certain cause. This was a unified kingdom. He's not going to do anything without his body. And that means every single person needs to be on board with this thing. Everybody is important in this kingdom. So, this, for, so the first message I really jumped into was the me has to become a we. Remember that? The me has to become a we if we're going to get to this, this treasure. Uh, then we, we learned we're fitly joined together. And then we learned about peacekeeping. Because you know you can't work with anybody very long without having some conflict. Amen? I don't know any family. If you got a marriage that never has conflict, I worry about that. Somebody is, somebody is hiding something. They're avoiding conflict at any cost is what they're doing. And you just wait because it will come out. It will come out. They may be real passive aggressive or they may just be one of those people who just leave on you. They just leave. They just walk off and leave. That's hard because people can do that. People are afraid of conflict. They don't want to do that. They'll leave your church rather than tell you that, that this is bothering me. Y'all know that? Because it's scary sometimes. to, And so we have these things we started learning about ourselves. And so as we started learning about peacekeeping, we had to learn if we're going to have a unified kingdom, that this valuable kingdom is that we're going to have to learn how to talk to each other, how to listen to each other, how to get each other. 
And so that's why the Lord provided the life language classes and, and the profile and these things. We're, we're, we're endeavoring, he said, endeavoring to keep the unity. That means you're going to work at it. It don't just happen. Y'all know that? You know a good marriage don't just happen. You're going to have to endeavor. Don't look at me like I'm the only one who had to work on my marriage. If you want to be a happy one, oh, David's looking straight ahead. I am not moving. Do not look left or right. We need to invest in these things because it's a treasure. And when it's important to you, you will do what it takes. I've said this before to some people spend more on their the get married at a big old wedding and spend nothing afterwards to stay married, to even go to conferences. You can't get them to come to conferences or buy books or do things. This is, when you find something precious, don't you know you'll invest in it? So we're trying to keep this kingdom and realize what we have here. And so uh, the last message I did was it's a productive kingdom. And it's not going to be productive to the point it needs to be until we're together, until everybody's doing their part. And so um, uh, I was thinking about a kingdom. I was thinking about uh, what makes a country or a kingdom great. What makes it valuable? If we're saying that this kingdom is valuable, why is it valuable? Why is it a pearl of great price? The kingdom of God is like this treasure. Well, I was thinking about a natural kingdom, a natural country. What makes this country so great that we're having to try to figure out ways, we'll do this without being political, trying to figure out ways how to keep our country safe with as many people that's trying to get in our country? Why is it people's trying to get to America? Freedom. Prosperity. What? Opportunity. You see, there's something that draws us to a kingdom. Something draws people. We're not out recruiting and saying, hey, come to America. No, we're trying to figure out ways that people can come and be immigrants and still be safe and know who they are and, and, and be able to document and all these things. We're trying to figure out. Because I heard a saying one time that says, you can tell the greatness of a country by the number of people that's trying to get in rather than those that's trying to get out. Yeah. Is that the truth? Yeah. I don't see very many people trying to get in boats and get their way to Cuba. I just, I just don't see that, and I'm not downing anybody. But the truth is, why is it that they're coming from there to here, risking their life and their families? Families are, people are risking their lives under tunnels and going here and there and, and boats and, and, to get to America. There's something valuable here. Well, see, I want to use this as far as the kingdom. We should be people, we, 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 we should be having to build, a, well, we're already looking at it, building a bigger building. The kingdom, when, we, when people really know what you have, you, gotta, you don't have to advertise. People want to come. So what is it that makes a kingdom so y'all said some of the things. I was thinking about uh, our country. One of the reasons people want to come here is because it's not war-torn. There's peace in our borders. It's a safe place. Now, we know where some of our safety has been shaken. We've had school shootings, and we had all the ISIS coming in. That, that's died down, hallelujah, praise God. So we're not as having, we, you know, we had had another 9-11. We've had other things. But, but even with that, America's still a safe country. It's one of the safest. There's, there's, not, there's peace, and we seek peace. We're trying to make negotiations with people. We're seeking peace for other countries. Pe America's a peace-loving country. It, and you don't find people trying to get into a war-torn country. You, you're getting out. You've got refugees. You're trying to get the heck out of Dodge because there's war and there's bombs. We don't, so here we have a peaceful country, so people trying to get here. Another thing, somebody said it, it's, it's prosperous. There's a, this is still the land of opportunity. It still is. There is still, this is a blessed country. It's a prosperous country. It's a place where there's opportunity. There's, there's a place where there's resources. There's resources here. That's what makes America, them try to get in here. And so, I, I, and then the, the other thing is, is, is that we care. We care about our people. And I don't care what party you're part or whatever you think. Of, the truth is both parties are trying to find a way to take care of the poor. They're trying to find a way to take care of the immigrants. They're trying to find a way. We really have a caring country. And what really brought that to my attention was when I went to Dominican last year. And we were driving around, and, and it was like 
you know, this wouldn't even be half bad, some of these neighborhoods, but there was trash piled everywhere. Trash is piled up by the streets and dogs and animals just, you know, scurrying around. It just, it just looks so filthy. Because Travis was like, why is it, don't have any trash service? He said, well, we did have a real good one with the last person who was running things because his brother-in-law was over the trash things and, and they run everything on bribes and it's who you have. It's about what makes it for me. But he said, now the guy, he don't have any connections with it, so they don't even care. They don't even, our government's not even paying for trash. So see, in other words, they're self-serving. They don't really care about their people. They don't care if there's sewage in the streets. They don't care, but, oh, if it benefited me, we'll get some trash trucks out there. So I realize there's something real valuable, things we take for granted in America, that we have trash service, that not only we, we have utilities, we have them, some streets don't have potholes, but we, at least we try, to, we try to take care of our streets. Okay? Some countries don't have that. They don't care about their population. They, we, there's a, this is a caring country. So I, what I want to do is equate that to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. How do we get people here? Is this about running around trying to, uh, like I've said before, a fruit tree, trying to run around and throw its fruit, throw apples and hit people in the head, you know, come here, come here, you know, take my fruit. No, I've, I'm an apple tree. When they see this, America's like a beautiful apple tree. People are coming and trying to get some peace off of it. They're trying to get a, a, a piece of the good life off of it. And so the kingdom of God is, I think, is really close to this. I was thinking about this. First of all, it's a prosperous country. We said that. This, this, this kingdom of God, I'm telling you what, you, you can come to God with nothing. It's amazing. And I'm not talking about just physical. First of all, you can come to him broke, busted, and disgusted, and, and, and addicted, and everything else. And you come, and what starts happening? You start, you start getting free. You start getting a little better. You get better. Somebody Monday night, what, I forget, one of the guys is like, well, you know what, I'm, soon, I'm fixing to get a car. I'm fixing to get my car back. I'm fixing to get my license back. Do you all know life can take you to the bottom? It can take you all the way to the bottom. That just, we're praying just somebody can get their driver's license back. But you know what? That's a start. And I'll tell you what, you, when you start with God, uh, there is no way up but up. There's no other way but up. He starts prospering you from the minute you get in this thing. Prospering you in your mind, in your soul, and in your families, and in your relationships, and in, in your money. So this is a prosperous, and we just had those scriptures up there. He used the word prosperous in 1 Corinthians 16 and 2. He said, upon the first day of the week, let everyone of you lay up uh, by him in store as God has prospered him that there be no gatherings when I come. On the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. And I was thinking about that. Um, there's a reason he even has us, he has us to give, because he could just, money could come like manna. I mean, Peter needed to pay his taxes, and he went fishing, there was a fish with gold in his mouth. You know, God's not needing your money. Y'all know that, don't you? The money given is not about what that, the money is about my heart. It's about me remembering that this is a prosperous kingdom, that God has prospered and prospered me. He said, let everyone as he purpose in his heart. On the first day of the week, that's Sunday, y'all know that, lay in store by him as God has prospered him. It makes me think, every time I write that ties check, well, I do online now, but every time I figure that, it makes me like, wow, we made more this week. We made more. I realize how God has prospered. He wants us to remember we have a great treasure here. That God takes care of our families. And then I remember when we first came, when we first got married, how poor we are. And, and we'd still, we'd just give that, we had a, we'd just give this amount. And we may not even know how we're going to pay the rent, but that came first. We understood the principle of the tithe was about the first fruits. It was what the first money we got, we wrote that check to the church. It was already again, it was before Walmart, before Piggly Wiggly back then. Uh, but, um, Hoggly, well, I don't know. We don't have Piggly Wiggly, I don't think, anymore. But we, we would we go to Piggly Wiggly, and, and I remember those things. But I've watched as God has prospered us, not just, I'm not talking just about money, but we have grown. Gary and I, and he showed us, I am your provider. You don't have to worry. I will take care of you. This is a treasure. This is something to tell your people. And that God will provide all your needs, honey. I don't know. I have people that, the young single mothers, I have people all the time in desperate need. I'm like, I can't tell you how he's going to do it, but I know if you'll seek his kingdom first, God will provide or he's a liar. He will provide for you. Now, that doesn't mean he's gonna, uh, that you just go out and squander your money. You're not a good steward, and you're, and you're, you're drinking all your money up. You mentioned somebody all this stuff. I'm going to tell you something. If he has to let you get to the bottom, all the way to the bottom of the barrel, uh, the bottom of the bottle, 
to bring you up. He will because he loves you because he wants to prosper your mind, your body. You cannot have a very prosperous life, very good relationships. You can't be a good parent if you're addicted all the time. And, you, and your money is going here and there and, and you're living that life. He's trying to get us to be truly prosperous. In fact, in uh, John 3, uh, 3 John 1 and 2, he said, 1 and 2, Beloved, I wish above all things, this was Paul writing, I believe it was, I mean, he said, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Your soul prospers. See, he's in, that's my mind. That's the core of me. That's my emotions. He wants me to be well developed and other things just come out of that. Y'all know that. Then you'll have other things. He said, you seek his kingdom, his kingship. Let him be first. Paul said, I want you to be healthy. Do you know you can't be healthy when you're stressed out all the time? It's very hard to be healthy when you're stressed out. And so he wants us stressing about money. No, he wants us to, to prosper and be in health. And you know what that word prosper means? I, I was funny. I looked it up, and it says to help on down the road. That sounds like a song, like a country song or something. <laughs> to get to where you need to be. I thought it was about money. No, prospering means to help you along. Help your marriage along. Help your finances along. Help your kids along. It's a prospering. It's moving on down into what you need to be. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming up to what God has planned for you to be, to realize you have treasure inside of you. I have treasure inside of me he's trying to pull out. So this is a prosperous kingdom. And you can let people know that. Let people know your testimony. I talked about that last week, the word of reconciliation. We, we have a word to tell people. This is what you tell people. God is a good God. You know what I know? Let's pray about those finances. I prayed a lady at a business and she took me aside and she said, I just need you to pray for me. And she said, um, when you get through doing, would you just come back by my office? And I did. And she said, my, my son and I have been put out of her house. I, I don't know what we're going to do. I can't get anybody to rent to me right now. I can't get aid here. And this is going on with this. And you know, I make too much money for that. Too much. You know, those kind of things. And, and she said, would you just pray? And I didn't really have any answers for her. Because everything she said was true. I know how the government works. I know how things can trip you up. Y'all know what I'm talking about. She was a very legitimate need. And I said, well, let's just pray about it. We're going to do that. And that's not just, well, let's just pray. You know, like it's the last recourse. But I said, let's just pray right now. And I prayed, and we prayed about that. And I said, God, you know, you're going to make, you know, you can make a way for my sister. I'm letting the petitions be made known. And so I just talked to her, and you know, I was watching. I've been watching to see, did I get to hear any news? You know, hers. I saw her on Facebook this week. Hallelujah, I got my keys to my new house. I, I hadn't got to go back to that business, but I was watching because I was expecting God to show her his power that I will be a provider. And I'm thinking, she's going to ask me to pray. I want to see some results, Lord. I'm praying with some faith here. I'm putting my words out there. My name's on the Now, I know it's up to him when, how, and why, but the truth is he will do that. Will he not? Will he not provide all your needs according to his riches and glory? He either is or he ain't. He either true or it's a lie. This is reality. This is a real thing. It's tangible for people. We have a valuable kingdom. That's why we sold out to him. We know the, the, the benefits of this kingdom. So that's prosperity. This, I'm going to jump on it. Caring kingdom. It's a caring kingdom. Our king cares about you. Do you know that? He's not a dictator to out for his own good. God is, he loves his people. Deuteronomy 11, 12 says, there's a land that the Lord thy God cares for. His eyes of the eyes of the Lord are always upon it from the beginning of the year, even to the end of the year. I love that. There's a land. And back then the land was a physical land. It was a promised land. It was a natural Jerusalem. Now who's the land? We are the good soil. We are the land. And we're that city. We're the city set on the hill. Now we are the one that he's watching over from the beginning of the year to the end. Second Chronicles 16 and 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf. Oh, I love this scripture. He's, he's looking for people to ask for something that he could show himself strong to them on their behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. That means, per means it's, it's totally. It means it's complete. I just, my heart is you, Lord. I need you. Perfect is not perfect person. That's a perfect, be complete. I'm sold out. Lord, I'm, I'm looking to you. He's looking for people to look to him so he can show himself strong. Amen. Jesus was talking about he was a good shepherd. 
He was a good shepherd. John 10, 12 and 14, he said, he that's a hireling and not the shepherd whose sheep they're not. They see the wolf come and they leave the sheep. They flee and the wolf, wolf catches them and, they, and he scatters the sheep. They're a hireling. They don't really care, see. They're doing it for the buck. He said, the hireling flees because he's a hireling and he careth not for the sheep. That's 13 verse. He's a hireling. He don't care for the sheep. But Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and are known. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Guys, if you ha there are people that get into it for the money. There's people that get it. I'm going to tell you something. This is not a money thing. This is about I care. We need to be able to care for people that can do nothing for you in return. Can I need to say that again? You know that's what compassion is. You know that's what it is. And mercy, it's doing for somebody that they can't do anything for you. In fact, they're just probably going to need to take from you. Can you love people without expecting anything in return? That's what Jesus does. He loved us first. He loved us first. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. So this is, a, this is a caring kingdom. Now, the last one I want to say is this is a safe kingdom. I start off with America being a safe place. I want to really talk about this for a few minutes. Is this a safe kingdom? All right. Well, you know what I realize and what we, we used to think, you know, what, what, say this carefully, what we used to call church or we consider church, I discovered really wasn't too safe. We have a generation, we have a lot of people, old and young, that do not go to church today because of why? They were hurt in church. Let down, wounded. He said, was wounded in the house of a friend. You see, I want to pay attention to that. I want people to know. You know, just erase the past. If you got somebody you're talking to and you're all excited about your church, you're like, like mm-hmm. Yeah, I got excited about one of those one time. Well, you get to know them long enough. You'll find out. You hear that little bitterness come up. What you're hearing is pain. Don't get mad at them. You're hearing pain. Just jump on the pain. Don't jump on the bitterness and try to convince them that somehow your church is better. No, you need to look at the pain. And you just say, it sounds like somebody hurt you. And even if you had to be one of those people say, you know, I can, I can kind of identify how you feel because I felt that way. Feel, felt, found. We used to do that in sales. I know how you feel. I felt that way, but I found. I used to sales. I, yeah, I know. I, I, I used to think this was real expensive, but you know, I found that it's, it's, we learned sales, but I learned selling the kingdom of God is just like selling something else you're excited about if it's for real. It's, and so it's, it's like, I know you've been hurt. I have, I have too. Or I know somebody else has been hurt. And you address the hurt and you go, but you know what? Jesus is a safe shepherd. People let us down, but he'll never let you down. You got to point them back to him. And then you can say things we've discovered that if you're going to be a part of the church we go to, you're probably going to need to be imperfect because perfect people just don't fit here. <laughs> Remember what I said? We need t-shirts. It says, I have issues. Follow me to Christian gathering. <laughs> <laughs> you fit right in here. I hope you fit right in here. I want this to be a safe house. The people can come. I don't care how wounded they've been, how disappointed they've been, even if they were the person doing the wounded because you know hurting people hurt people. And then there's some people who go, ooh, do I really want them there? I remember what they did over there. Oh, you can look at that or you can say, no, they're wounded. Let's heal their hurts because hurting people will continue to hurt people. God wants us to be safe people. And what that means is, is that we got to get to the place where no matter who comes in those doors, they're going to be accepted, they're going to be loved, and they're going to be treated with respect, and they're not going to be isolated, and not going to be like, well, this sin is above this sin, or you're this, or I'm that. See, that old business is going to have to stop. I think it is stopping. But for years, we used to divide ourselves by denominations. You could, if you was this, you was that, you know, we was, we was teasing something about Baptists this morning. I'm like, well, come on here. You join the rest of us Baptists. Well, I never, really never was a Baptist, but since I'm in the kingdom, I claim to be them all. Because the truth is, it's not about denominations anymore. It's about being Christians. 
We've all, most of us here have been through some church somewhere. We called ourselves something. And at this place, really, truly, when this started, it was just, we're just going to gather some Christians together. And we're not even going to gather them because the, the, the scripture on our sign says, for let the redeemed of the Lord say so, for he has gathered us from the north, south, east, and the west. See, that's been our motto here. It's not about us beating the doors down. It's just going around talking how great the kingdom of God is. And they go, hey, I want what, some of what you got. Where do you go to church? Oh, come on. We're going to Valley View. It's like a little secret. It's kind of hid over here. But you know what? It's a great treasure. Because it's a safe place. It's a prosperous place. It's a caring place. People need to know what you have. They need to, this is how you spread the gospel. It's the good news. It's that God, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their sins against him. It's made us now the ministers of reconciliation. I now am going to serve you and show you how you can come together with him and you can come together with people. People want him, but they don't want them. <laughs> But the truth is, we don't, you don't, it's, it's a package deal. He does this with his body. That's why we, as the body, have got to be safe. But for years, we divide ourselves with denominations. We divide ourselves with uh, color, race. I mean, Sunday morning was the most divided, and, and still is a lot of places. The most divided place of the week is Sunday morning. Everybody goes to their old church. You have your Asian churches. You have your Spanish-speaking churches. You have your uh, 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 redneck churches. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you have, but, I mean, you know, birds of a father, feather, birds of a feather kind of flock together. But, you know, we divided ourselves by so many things. We divided ourselves before, uh, uh, and I mentioned last week, a church I was a part of had a big old split over marriage and divorce. We split out over things. We got so hung up on the doctrine that we forgot the people. We forgot the value of this kingdom. Instead of working things out and knowing how to endeavor to keep the unity of the peace, we just separate. Well, bless God, I'll just go down here and start my own little church. That's why we're divided all over the world, all over the country. But you know what? There's a walls are coming down. There's some walls that are coming down. And Sister uh, 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 Samantha sent me a song two weeks ago. A song that, boy, I'll tell you what, the, it's, I don't know if y'all have heard it, but it's called The Healing Has Begun by uh, Matthew West. And I think one of the first lines of, uh, in the first verse, it's just jumped out at me. It says, freedom can't be found behind those walls. So we said one of these reasons people love America because it's got freedom, and it's true. But you know what? You can sit, you can be so locked up sitting in a free nation. You can be so locked up, still set in a kingdom that's freedom because you have walls that you have built around you. What are those walls for? Protection, self-protection. Hurt me once, shame on you. Hurt me twice, shame on me. So we're going to put bigger walls and every time I go to another church, a bigger wall, every time I go into another relationship, another wall, a second marriage, another wall, third marriage. Another, we have all these walls of protection. But it's hard to ever find freedom behind those walls. But the only way we're going to get people to take their walls down is if it's safe. We've talked about this. The people feel, they don't feel safe with you, then they keep the walls and they had to put their church face on. We had to put the mask on because I'm, I'm really afraid. And that, and that way they never really can receive your love. Why? Because they think you only love, oh yeah, I know you love me, but you really only love the part I'm letting you see. You really, if you really knew me, you wouldn't love me. You can only love what I let you see. So inside you go, if you really knew me, you really wouldn't love me. You only love and accept what I let you see. But if you really knew this about me, you probably wouldn't love me. So they walk around not feeling loved. That's what shame does to you. So see, when you out yourself, see, the, the enemy can hold that over your head. If they knew that about you, they wouldn't really love you. But when you out yourself, that's what we do on Monday nights at our house. We have a rule, you can out yourself, but you can't out anybody else. So when we get safe in that room, it's a safe room, and all of a sudden somebody can say, I need y'all to really pray for me because I am struggling. I've still got this addiction. I'm still dealing with this or I'm dealing with that. And we can say, instead of going, oh, no, we're like, oh, Come on. Somebody goes, hey, I had that too. You? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm still struggling. But you? You're still struggling? You're not, you're, I thought y'all were all just like, mm, ooh, no. <laughs> That's just how we pretend we come in the house. It, don't we do that? Don't we all put our mask on? Our kids are doing it at school. They're wearing masks. Everything's got to be through a screen. I've got to make myself beautiful. It, it, it's a sad place to be because then nobody can really know me. People can't really know. And if you don't know each other, it's easier to hurt each other. 
Because if you know that about somebody and you see that little lady over there and you go, man, I can't believe she's doing that, that, and that. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you, let me tell you the rest of the story. If you knew this about her, you'd be like, oh, well, look how far she's come. You don't know where she was at. You talk about her day, but you don't know that six months ago uh, she was uh, uh, working in an exotic dance seat and all these things. Now, now, yeah, she's this, this, but don't you be, do you don't know how far that girl's come. Like, really? Yeah, then I want to run across there and hug her neck and make sure instead of going, I can't believe she's dressing like that. But you know the story gives you compassion. Is that not true? So that's why I tell people, I say, man, I wish I could tell all y'all stories. Because if you knew the stories, you would love each other. You would see, we have heroes in this room. You see people that's been through Hades and back and are back and hellfire and brimstone and they're sitting here today. You'd be like, you need to have a movie written about you. You need to have a book written because we have some overcomers in this house, honey. You don't get this kind of power without a lot of pain. How many of y'all know the truth about that? As there's a foundation of people that's come through some pain here, that's why this is a safe place because we ain't got nobody to judge because we don't know for the grace of God I'd still be there. Paul said, if such is some are y'all, he said. He was talking to the church. He said, you are these things. Don't forget how far God's brought you. Every time you want to start pointing fingers and talk, judging somebody, you need to stop and say how far the Lord has brought me from or thank God you had good parents that kept you from some of that stuff. If you knew their parents, see, when I worked in the prison, I'd talk to those boys. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at their stacks of, you know, they've been through juvie 15 times before they ever got to TYC. They'd done all kind of crime, did all kind of stuff. They was the bad boys. But you know, if I just looked at that, I'd be like, hmm, lock them up and throw away the key. But you know what? I knew I'd look a little deeper, and I saw really what happened. They, ne- they didn't ever know their daddy. The mama is in jail, and even grandma has been got arrested last week for meth at grandma's house. And you're going, Phew. No wonder they joined a gang, and no wonder they're doing this stuff. They get some. They feel like there's somebody because they can do some work, which is nothing but crime. And it starts making sense when you get behind the scenes and you see a little bit of the rest of the story that our Father in Heaven knows. You'll find you really can't judge anybody. We can't judge. It's not our place. Thank. Aren't you glad He did not put you on the throne? No, no. My hardest job in the world is just to love you. Y'all know it's hard to love each other all the time. We love some of the people some of the time. <laughs> We're loving all the people all the time is a job, isn't it? It's a lot of forgiveness and forgiveness and forgiveness and working each other, long suffering. That's why that word long suffering is in the Bible a lot. It's a fruit of the Spirit to suffer long. He said to put up with one another because we're just humans. We are imperfect people, but we have a perfect God. I want people to come in. We separate ourselves because of... Um, what I say a while ago, a divorce, criminal history. We, def- we separate our stuff right now is whether people are straight or gay. They're having to go find places where they can come to church where they don't, they're not treated differently and they're not pointed out and treated like they're, you know, like they're the plague or something. We got to get over that, people. Wait till it's your son or daughter or your grandchild. You better, we got to get over that. This church needs to be safe for every... Y'all better not get quiet. I smile when I do that right there. Wait, you know what's happening? We could even divide each other by political stuff. Our, not, our country right now is, what, and that's what's happening. I want everybody to be safe in this house. I don't care if you're liberal. I don't care if you're conservative. I don't care how you vote. We need to watch ourselves. We need to watch our mouths and not get so carried away that we let that be a division place. Don't fall in the, the world right now with that. Now, I'm not saying we ever need to compromise our morals, our values, our doctrines. I, I'm not a compromising person. But let me tell you something. I can get along with anybody. I can show love and respect for anybody. And that's God's business, where they are and what they do. It's not my job to convince you to be like me. It's my job to be Christ to you. Let God heal our people everywhere they hurt. I want this church to be a place that I don't care what, where you come, where you're at. And I'm not talking about, yeah, I love you. No, I'm talking about accepting you. I'm not saying accept your life. I'm saying accepting you. Oh, it took me a long time to know that God, I was really the accepted and the beloved. I knew he loved me because he had to. God is love. But what I didn't know is that he accepted Pam. That he accepted me on my worst days. I was still the accepted and the beloved. He accepts us right where we are. And I love that saying. It said he loves me where I'm at, but he loves me too much to leave me where I'm at. 
See, I want us to have everybody safe. And the same time that we are helping people, the same time we're pointing them to better and better and better. And we, and it, and we just do that by letting the Holy Spirit move and do his, his job. Can people be safe around here? Can they be safe around here? Let me tell you, uh, there's nothing perfect but God. There's nothing perfect but God. I don't know if you've heard this, the 80-20 the rule. I don't know if I've mentioned it here. I probably some of you individually. But I heard some preacher. I can't own this. Yet. I heard somebody else talking about this. But it really made sense to me. And, and it's, so, it's so amazing. It's, it's about what you look at. So I, it, they just said, as far as people are concerned or things that the best we are, it might be 80%. A hundred percent person might get it right 80% of the time. Nobody gets everything right all the time, right? There's no 100% perfect marriage. There's no 100% uh, perfect church. There's no 100% job. There's no 100% country, right? Right now we could focus on the things that America has wrong and it's about maybe 20% might be pushing a little more. But the truth is we're 80% still a city set on the hill. We are still a wonderful country. But what we can do, the enemy's job is to let us look at the 20%. And I'm telling you, I, I, this guy was talking. He said, you could be careful. You could have an 80% marriage. I'm talking about as good as it can get. You can have the mother of your children right there. You could have been through all these things and been married for 30 years. And all of a sudden, in a tough time in your marriage, and all of a sudden you're alone, you've kind of grown apart. You know, you're just not having your date nights and, you, and stuff's happening and you grow apart. If you've been married long enough, you can grow apart. And all of a sudden, some, somebody on that job is just making you feel so great. Well, if I, well, if you were mine... I'd bring you roses. <laughs> Where'd that come from? Uh, if you were mine, oh, I, I'd be home. I'd be home. I'd have your supper ready every day at 5 o'clock. Because you're just, man. Oh, they just start stroking all of a sudden. Before you know it, you feed into that. You could wake up one day laying beside a 20%. And your 80% is home with the kids. You got focus. They met that little 20 cent wouldn't just work it right then. You can walk off and leave an 80% church because you got your feelings hurt or something you didn't like going on. And you find yourself somewhere, oh, I got that. They don't play their music so loud. And they sing more hymns than they do over here. Whatever it is that you can get hung up on. And you can find yourself missing maybe the best thing ever happened. I'll tell you something. The spirit of God that's in this house right here, you can't deny that. You cannot. It's a treasure from a, it, that's hidden in the field. You can find yourself walking off because of a 20% problem and walk off on 80%. You can do it in a job. You can do it in all kinds of things. So don't get distracted by the enemy, by the 20%, and miss what you have. Don't stop valuing what you have. Value each other. Nobody's family is perfect. Nobody's church, nobody's country, only him. He's the one to fill in the 20% for you. He'll fill in the gaps for you. That's where we start looking because when I start looking at other places to meet those needs, it always costs me. Yes. And how many can amen to that? Yes. God has a reason for every rule he put, every commandment he put, every time he's speaking to you. Do you know it's just because he loves you and he wants you to be safe? He wants your home to be safe. He wants your family to be safe. He wants your marriage to be safe. He's trying to bring us to a peaceful deal if we would listen to him. And Jesus, our, our God had written in Leviticus, in the Old Testament, he said, uh, Leviticus 25, 17, he said, you shall now therefore oppress one another. So they was even oppressing each other back then, they had to be reminded. Don't, don't put each other down, don't, don't oppress each other. But thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God, wherein you shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. You will dwell in the land in safety. And the land you shall yield her fruit and you will eat your fill. And you'll dwell therein safely. He said, if you do it my way, not only will you eat your fill, not only will you have abundance, but you'll be safe. See, he, he made things, he told us things for a reason. 
um, even the, the laws of our land. In First Timothy 1, 8 through 10, he says, For we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly, the sinners, the unholy, the profane, the murderers of fathers, the murderers of mothers, manslayers. Uh, oh, he just goes on and on. He says, he says, he goes, what I've given you in this country is to keep you safe. He said, even, even in the natural, the laws are given to us. To, aren't, we, aren't we glad there's a law that says thou shalt not kill? I'm not just talking about Moses' law. I'm talking about in our land today. Hey, why is it there? It's there today for the same reason it was back then. Being in a murderous country is not very safe. We want people to have a consequence. It's always been wrong to murder. It was wrong when Abel killed Cain. Cain killed Abel. Excuse me. It was wrong then. But years later, he made it a law and said, now there's going to be some consequences. But see, we can get hung up on the things that God's saying. Don't do this, don't do this. And, and we go, well, and our kids especially. That we need to teach our kids that sin is only sin because it's bad for you. It's not a bunch of rules to be killjoy. No, it's because it's how you keep safe in the land. His kingdom is safe. When he tells you to don't to gossip or anything, he's trying to tell us to be safe. Rules are made for safety. Do y'all know that? The stop signs and the speed, speed limit signs are not just to aggravate me. They're actually to keep us safe. So he's put some things in line. And he said, if you would follow my ways, if you just follow my ways, he said, you'll have to be blessed and you will be safe. This is how we have the safety. Proverbs 8 and 18, 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run in are safe. Proverbs, he said, well, there's no counsel, people fall, but there's a mul when there's a multitude of counselors, there's safety. Do you know in this church you have a multitude of counselors? In other words, there's a whole bunch of us trying to tell you what to do. No, not really. No. <laughs> The truth is we want to give God the counsel, receive it because we care about each other. We're trying to get in your business, not just trying to get in your business. We're trying to get there so we can help you along. We want you to open up and, and let us see the whole thing so we can say, yeah, I love that too. I may not like it, but I love it because I love you. You're valuable, Tish. You're valuable right where you are. And so we can help pull the treasure out. We want to remind people the benefits of this kingdom. That this is a treasure. And like I said last week, when your heart is full, he says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you're really in love with him, everybody should know it. If you really love your church, you should know it. If you're in love with Jesus, it shouldn't have to be something. Somebody has to go give you a witness in class to get you to talk about. It should come up out of us. And if it's not coming out of you, ask yourself why. Have you fell out of love? Is Jesus just become like old head? Just, okay, we're not having our date nights. Sunday morning is like a date night. You know, it's like a date with Jesus. <laughs> Ask yourself why. Have you fallen out of love with him? Have you forgot the treasure you have? And other things just started covering it up and you forget. So either you've forgotten, either you're not really treasuring it, or maybe like I said last week, maybe there's something stopping you up like fear. Maybe you still have one of those walls. It's hard to be free behind those walls because you're afraid to let the people on the job know because then they might know because they, they know the other parts of me. They see me. They, they may expect something out of me. They may think, I, oh, you think you're all that? No, get rid of all those lies. Don't hold back when you see somebody that needs a safe country. Don't look back. Don't hold back when you need somebody that needs some prosperity in their life. They need help. Just be willing to tell them and say, look, you know, I ain't perfect, but I know a God it is. I you want you to come to me. Come with me to a little church with a bunch of imperfect people. They're going to love and accept you right where you are. We're not going to ask you to clean yourself up. We're not going to ask you to change this. Just come and be loved. See where you fit in the body. Let the Lord fit you, fitly join you together. Because people are lonely. People are separated. People are looking for somewhere to belong. Do y'all know that? And they don't want to come to a country that's war-torn. Poverty, you just have to strain to get a little piece of God. Our house is abundance of the Spirit of God. Abundance of love, abundance of care. People care about you. We have so many groups, we, you, you can't get hide from us. Why? Because we want to know you. We want you to let us see you so we can love the, all of you. Let us make it safe so you can get behind your, out from your walls so the healing can begin. So I'll close with 
Ephesians 4, 29 and 20, 32 says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. And I said this last week, but that which is good are the use of edifying. In other words, corrupt communication is that that tears down. But he said, but he told you what to do. But let us minister grace. Let's let people know about the great, the joy, the treasure of grace, that I can minister grace to the hearers. He said, and, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. It grieves God when you, let, when you tear people down. That's what it's saying. It grieves him. Our fathers grieve when we do that. He said, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put from you with all malice. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. In 1 Peter, not rendering evil for evil, wait, railing for railing, but counterwise blessing, knowing that you're therefore called that you should inherit a blessing. So when I bless, I get blessed. When I give, it's given back to me. This is the kingdom, uh, uh, this is the culture of this kingdom. For he that will love life and see good days. Do you want that? Yes. He that love life and see good days, let him refrain his evil tongue from evil, that his lips speak no guile. Let him askew evil and do good and seek peace and ensue it. So see, this is how I can come and tell people, uh, Psalm 66, 16, come and hear all you that fear the Lord. I will declare what he has done for my soul. When you're not, not just idle words we talked about last week, you're just shooting the breeze. Don't just say, sometimes you just need to say, let me hear you. Let me just tell you what the Lord did for my soul yesterday in church. He made me calm down. I walked away with some peace. My soul is better because I was there with the people of God, because I came into his presence. We have something to tell people. I'm reminded of the words that on the Statue of Liberty. I think this applies to the kingdom. But y'all know, y'all know how the, the words start off? Bring me your what? Some of it, okay. He said, actually, he sorry, he said, give me your tired. <laughs> tired. How many people, I've been hearing it lately, they'll just say, I'm just tired. And they're not even talking about needing rest, about the, the body. They're just tired. They're tired of going around the same mountain. They're tired of going to church and maybe coming and going, not really feeling like nothing really happened. Nothing really changed. They're tired of just doing the routine. They're tired of the same old, same old. They're tired of the rat race. They're, they're, they're just tired of being sick and tired. He's, and, and America, she's standing there with that torch. Bring me your tired. Bring me your poor. Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. There's huddled masses. There's people huddling around to mar at your job around the water fountain that's longing to be free longing for to be free. They want to breathe. I love those words, to breathe free. Send me your wretched, your refused, your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, the tempest toss to me. I lift up my lamp beside the golden door. That's our job. Lift up the light before the golden door. The door to the kingdom. The, the door of the kingdom that is open. And Paul, Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, you don't go in yourself and you, you keep other people from going in. You won't go all the way in. You're just going to hold, hold them right here hostage. You hold them, but you won't go in and you won't let them go in. See, that's what a lot of people do. They, they got Jesus, but they just stand in the way of it. They're not even really letting know that there's a treasure that's hidden in the field. We are to be the city of sell on the hill. Ronald Reagan made a statement about the city on the hill. He's talking about America. He said, America should be a shining city on a hill whose beacon, whose, whose beacon lights the way to freedom. God's freedom-loving people everywhere. It guides freedom-loving people. There's people around you wanting to be free behind their walls. It's our job to say you can be safe and let your walls down. We know a way to get you healed. We know a way for a better life. That the rest of your life can be better than the former part of your life. I had to tell that to people all the I told it to Richard today. I said the latter half of your life is going to be much different than the first half. Thank God. How many of y'all can say thank God it's not where you start but where it's your ending. God has got more. The best is yet to come. And the older I get the more I treasure that. I'm not looking at shriveling up and dying and getting old. I have stuff that I want to do. I want to hold the light and say, here's a golden door. There's a kingdom that's a treasure 
I found it and you can have it too. You actually have treasure inside of you you don't even know yet. People have dumped on you. They've told you what you're not. We want to tell you what you are. You're precious. You matter. On your worst day, God loves you and accepts you right there. And we want to do the same thing. Bring me your huddled masses longing to breathe free. John Kennedy said we must be a city set on a hill constructed and inhabited by men aware of their grave trust and great responsibility. That's us. The way this city is built, this kingdom. He said you're a lot set on a hill, a country, a city set on a hill. It's done by people who are mindful, who are mindful who you are. That we have responsibility to get Bibles out. We have responsibility to do whatever we can. And don't make this about a program. Make this about today when you leave. It's, it's your sister at home. It's your sister. It's your brother that's locked up today when you go to see Jeff and we pray for Jeff and we send him letters. And, and I want to say this, this is an opportunity. I want more of you. Uh, Richard and his brother Eddie both got to go and some of the other men went down to the prison down in uh, Hudgens Unit down past Dallas and they got to minister to the people and they need more people. It's an opportunity for you guys to come on board with a prison ministry through Mike Barber Ministries. It's really easy to do and you can go in there. All of you need a trip to prison. Don't do crime to get there, but all of you need a trip to prison. It'll change your life. You need to go and experience that once time, especially if you think you're all righteous. Get down there and go down there and look in those little holes in those doors Look those people in the face. You need, we need a touch. Jesus told him, he said, you didn't visit me when I was in prison. He said, when did we see you in prison? He said, when you did it the least of these, you did it unto me. If you didn't do it the least of these, you didn't do it to me. That's a ministry that's right here from prison to praising. You know why? Because these are men and women who have been in prison. And they're going back and you don't have to go into prison. You don't have to be a been there and done that person to be effective. I was not a been there and done that person. I've been very effective working in the prisons. I've been very effective people that's in addictions, even though I've never been addicted. Don't start believing the lies. Well, that's for somebody else. No, you just need to listen to what the Lord puts on your heart. And I challenge you, take advantage of some of these things because it's going to open up your little mind. There's masses huddled waiting for somebody to show them the door, the golden door to freedom. You've discovered a treasure. Let's, let's do something about it. We've got a prosperous kingdom, a safe kingdom, a caring kingdom of people that you are a part of. It is constructed by people that realize that responsibility and won't hold it back, won't let your own shame, your own fear of rejection stop you from spreading the news. You, you don't have to be all confident. No, do it afraid. Courage means you do it in the face of fear. Courage is not the absence of fear, it's the presence of faith.